Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Trof, and it's a babbling Belgian, and welcome back to the brand new Gwent Edge, the show where we talk about every new thing that's happening in Gwent, and of course, very interesting decks to play with. But today, we're going to be talking specifically about patch 8.3 and everything that that has brought, in particularly the 12 new cards that we've received, the cards that are based on the uh, leaders that we had originally. It's the same card art as well, so. Uh, all those faces look very familiar, but uh, let's go through them one by one as our first topic of this video. So I'll just go through them in the manner that they're in the deck builder, so no particular order, just the order that they're in the deck building. And so the first one is our, the, well, the one and only king of the Northern Realms, King Foltest. 7 power, 12 provisions, and every time... Well, the first time a bronze unit on your side of the battlefield is boosted each turn, spawn a base copy of it at the bottom of your deck. And if it's, you have devotion, so you have no neutral cards or cards that are not supposed to be from your faction in your deck, uh, you also boost the spawned copy by one. This is a very interesting card. You're going to hear that a lot in this video because most of these 12 cards are very, very cool, very interesting, very powerful as well. So what this means is that this... Technically, gels very well with a few decks. So, most importantly, commandos. So, the four point commandos that you can pull from your deck with its own order ability. As long as you have King Voltest on the board, you can add another commando to your deck every single turn. Which is, I mean, commandos was already very powerful, but with this, I feel it, it, you could possibly just get two commandos in your deck every single turn depending on what cards you're using if you play your deck right that i mean your entire deck can be filled with commandos uh, other cards that come to mind are of course the dun banners uh, because they pull the copy from the deck if they're boosted so again something that can fill up a row very very quickly um, and then the other option might be the Centurion Royal Guards. They also benefit from having copies on the field, but of course you need a way to pull them from the deck if you do that. Which is definitely something you can do if you just prepare your deck with full test and then in the last round just slam the board with a bunch of Centurion Guards. But very, very strong indeed. Even without the fact that you're using Commandos or something like that, if you use uh, Erland in combination with this, so this guy, when it boosts all the units in your deck by one, you actually have way more units in your deck than you would normally have, and all those just get boosted by Erland if you use them at the very, very end, which is not something that he's usually used for, but could with Foltest. A lot of things to experiment with, but uh, I've tried out a few matches already, but not with this card. I've played mostly Syndicate and Monsters for now, so the uh, new Crown Spitters and the Vampire decks. But uh, I'll definitely try this out as well. Speaking of monsters, the Unseen Elder is back. So obviously a vampire and on deploy, he has 5 power by the way, 12 provisions again. Um, he gives 4 bleeding to an enemy unit, you can choose that unit, but at the end of your turn, that's where the engine capabilities of this card come in. So he gives 2 bleeding to a random enemy unit that does not have bleeding yet. So if there's no units that are not bleeding, then that will do nothing, but on Devotion, uh, he will also damage all the bleeding units on the board by one. And it's not directly damaging either. He triggers the bleeding without, I think it's without uh, ticking down the counter, if I'm not mistaken. I should try that again, but I think it's not ticking down the counter. But basically allowing you to double dip on bleeding every single turn. Which makes this one of the most powerful cards that they've added. This has immense ancient potential in a vampire deck. Remember, you can also copy him with Karantir, so you have two of these on the board, just completely obliterating your board. Against swarm decks particularly, this is going to be really, really powerful. You just stake out anything that's on the board um, in just a matter of a few turns. So definitely, definitely something to keep an eye on. I've tried this card out uh, a few times already, and it's just a game changer when he appears on the board. So Definitely something you can invest in if you like vampires. Next up, Emir Varemris, the Emperor of Nilfgaard himself. This is a very interesting card. 7 power, only 11 provisions, because we're going down the provision list, of course. And there's a lot of things going on with this card. So on Deploy, you can draw a card and then move a card, uh, discard a card from your hand to the bottom of your deck. So not discarding, but moving it to the bottom of your deck. That's one thing. 
always good to have as some sort of uh, tinning option. You move that card to the bottom, so you'll definitely not see that if you pull new cards. But then the passive abilities. Whenever your opponent plays a unit, give it spying. So basically, if you have Emir on the board, whenever your opponent plays a unit, you will trigger all your aristocrats and all your thirsty dames. That is just gonna happen. You have all those ancient cards are gonna trigger every time your opponent just plays a unit, aside from all the other bullshit that those cards already trigger on. So that on its own is very powerful. But if you have devotion, then there's another effect that at the end of your turn, you seize a random one power spying unit that is on your opponent's board. So any spying unit that you've played over there that still has one power or remember one of your opponent's units that has sticked down to one power and now has spying because of Emir can be seized. It's random, so you don't know what you're going to get, but you'll be seizing those. Those are That's two points every turn, which is very, very powerful. Um... The only thing, the only problem that I see with this card is that it will fill your board really quickly. So you have to be careful that you don't fill your board too quickly because Emir is just going to seize those units. And if you don't have space anymore for your next round, then yeah, then you're going to be in a bit of a problem. But there we go, Emir again, very powerful card. Next up, Squiretel, Bruver Hawk. So the Dwarven Leader has returned. Six power, 11 provisions, and on deploy he gains one armor for every Dwarf that is still in your hand. And if he has armor at the end of your turn, he will boost all Dwarfs with armor on this row by one. Sounds very powerful, but in practice this... Yeah, it's not that powerful as you might think. There's a few ways you can take him out. He can be locked, you can remove his armor, and uh, the boosts that are on the row also depend on the amount of dwarfs there are and if those dwarfs still have armor. So, very dependent on the situation, but it could be somewhere in the leagues of Gezras. Um, but a bit more powerful because you can control where the boosts are going, because you will always boost that same row while Gezras moves around a bit. It's an interesting card, but it's something that I have to try out to see if it's as powerful as it sounds, because I think it's not as powerful as it sounds. But still, it generates points at the end of every turn. Those cards are always very powerful, so uh, keep that in mind if you're... Uh, it's a very good addition for Dwarf decks. Then, one of the, um, well, kind of broken cards at this moment. Uh, there is a bug with this card, but first, before we go into that bug, I'll explain the card really quickly. So, Veteran, 3 power, 11 provisions, so at round 3 he will be 5 power. Est Twirzak, he's back. Uh, on deploy, if you have Blood Thirst 2, you draw a card and then discard a card, so very similar to what you're doing with Emir, but... Whenever you discard a Skellige unit, so it needs to be a Skellige unit during your turn, you summon it immediately from your graveyard to this row. So you can discard a card from your hand, and that card will immediately also be summoned, not played, from your hand to the row that Est is on. You can do this twice. That effect can trigger twice, and if you have Devotion, it also works if you just destroy a unit. So if your uh, a card gets nuked into the graveyard. Technically, it's very easy to trigger his ability, his two counters, immediately if you're using Blaze of Glory. So you, you play Aced, you draw a card, you discard the card that you want to have resurrected automatically, that happens, then you use Blaze of Glory, destroy a card from your deck, goes right into your graveyard, and then it gets played next to Ace Twirsuck as well, aside from the damage you're doing with uh, Blaze of Glory as well. Some of my teammates actually did the calculations here, and uh, you can do up to 39 points in one turn with this card, in normal circumstances, because there's a problem with it, but... Uh, so you pull um, a 10 power card from your uh, hand, discard that, that's 10 points, so you're already at 15. Then you uh, use Blaze of Glory, uh, can do 12 damage with Jutta, um, so then you're at 27, and then you can, uh, well, Jutta gets resurrected automatically, and that's another 12, and you get to 39, which is very, very powerful in its own right, but right now there's a tiny little bug, and that if Ice is on the field, and you use Lippy, then every single card that Lippy sends to the graveyard will be resurrected by Aced. The Gwen team is looking at this because it's, of course, this is ridiculous. It basically plays your entire deck on the board in one go. It's very funny to look at, but uh, yeah, it will get picked rather quickly, so keep that in mind. Still, you need Blutters to, to draw a card and discard a card, so you can't really use it immediately. But again, 
a very strong card that kind of reintroduces discards, which is something that I'm looking forward to. I'm hoping they'll continue this because the other changes didn't really change much about discarding cards in Skellige. And now we have Syndicate, Cleaver. So Cleaver, 1 power, 2 armor, 11 provisions. Very, very low, but he has Intimidate, so he gains a point every time you uh, use a crime card. And his deployability, of course, factors into that because he spawns and plays Shakedown. Shakedown, as you can see, gives you 3 coins and boosts an allied unit by 3. But it's also a crime card, so it also triggers the Intimidate immediately. But if you put him next to Crown Splitters, then you increase his Intimidate by one for each. So you can go up to Intimidate 3, the only card that can actually do this. Um, giving you three points for every crime card you play, including Shakedown that you play, and of course, every single card you play after that. His last ability is for four coins, you can spawn a Cleaver's Muscle on his row. So that is a five point card for four coins uh, with a shield. That is also a crown splitter. So if you don't have enough crown splitters on the board, you can play him right next to maybe the single one you have, uh, giving you Intimidate 2 for that first crime, but then use four coins to actually get another Cleaver's Muscle right next to him, and he is immediately protected. Very lore friendly card, by the way, because of course he's uh, flanked by two crown splitters on the card as well. Very powerful because, of course, Intimidate 3 means that he can boost himself by 3 every time you play a crime card, as long as he's on the board. And that fee also gives you a spender, able to just get rid of the excess coins by spawning another dwarf on the field. It's a very cool card. I've played around with this one specifically, and it does seem to get his, its value every time, of course, aside from when it gets nuked. Um, so yeah. Very interesting one to uh, keep an eye out for, because I think if you combine this with a very powerful crime deck, this can be something. The deck that I've made so far is performing very well and it's not optimized yet, so uh, I'm guessing we'll see some uh, really, really cool, may maybe even meta variations on uh, a Cleaver deck. Something that I just want to talk about really quickly, the addition of Cleaver single-handedly also makes this card feel like you're actually playing it correctly. Because um, for the first time, Nova Gradient Justice actually feels like you're using it in a crown splitter crime deck and that you're actually using it for that specific purpose. Because of course, you get multiple drawers from this, you get multiple crown splitters from this, and it's a crime card, so it triggers Intimidate as well. So it does, does give you the benefit more than just like giving you the fact that just the thinning in a square tail deck, which was always a bit weird that you would use it for that. You can still use it for that, but preferably in a dwarf deck. Then we get our second Skellige card. Krak on Crate is back. 7 power, 10 provisions, and he gives 2 armor to 3 pirates or ships in your hands. You can choose which one those are. Not that impressive at the first glance, but his passive ability, so you need to wait a turn to actually uh, trigger this, um, actually enables you to, whenever you play a pirate or a ship next to Krak, you damage that unit and the lowest power enemy unit by each shoulder's power. That might sound a bit confusing, but for example, if you play a four power boat right next to Krach, he uh, will check what the lowest enemy unit is. For example, there's a two power unit on the other side. That's the lowest power unit. You will do four damage uh, from the ship to that two, dam two power unit and then two damage on your ship. But you want to have your ships armored so you can benefit from that automatic damage even further with a bit of uh, self-harm units like, for example, the armored Drakkar is the ideal unit to use that on. Very, very cool. Um, I haven't really been able to test this out. We we're only one day into the patch, so uh, we'll uh, we'll see how that works. But uh, I am definitely planning on making a pirate stack because this sounds really, really cool. It is a passive ability. And the problem is, the, the one thing that I was kind of hoping for that maybe uh, Arnjolf is a pirate, because, I mean, Arnjolf is a pirate, Arnjolf the Patricide from the Patricide of Fury ability, but he doesn't have that attack. So sadly, he doesn't trigger this, because that could be 11 damage on a low power unit, which would be very, very nice if we could pull that off. But sadly, no uh, pirate attack. But there's plenty of cards that actually benefit from this. There's a few cards that have been changed to also fit the pirate and ship archetypes. Um, not to very outrageous extents, but it do does have some very good support now that it looks like we could actually make a viable deck with this. I know a few people that uh, are actually looking forward to finally making pirates and ships work on their own without the support of other warrior uh, type units. 
Yeah, and the second one for Northern Realms is also very, very good. So Queen Meave is back, 7 power, 2 armor, so very beefy to take out. Um, does not have a deployability, but if you are inspired, meaning that if this card is boosted, uh, you lower her counter by 1 at the end of your turn. Her counter starts at 3, a counter goes down every turn. So, meaning that if she is inspired, her ability will trigger on the next turn. Her ability is that when the counter reaches zero, you boost all allied units by one. Now that I think about it, I'm not exactly sure if the counter keeps resetting, because normally counters like that go down and then reset back to three. But that might be my Thronebreaker brain. I haven't checked out, uh, used the card yet. I should actually check the developer notes on this. It doesn't, judging from the developer notes, yeah, I'm actually doing this on the fly. Um, it doesn't look like she can do this multiple times. So it is basically a bone talisman that is triggered on a seven power unit, which is still very good. Um, but I was thinking that it might be able to trigger multiple times uh, every time you reset that counter, which wouldn't be too overpowered. I mean, Gesserals does the same thing every two turns, so... Is even more powerful than that, so I don't see why that wouldn't be the case. Something I'll have to try. If you know already, let me know in the comment section. I haven't been able to find time to test out every single faction just yet. And Eldane. Eldane is also back, so the, the second Squirtel leader who has returned. And his effect is basically the same as his original ability was. Six power, ten provisions, and on deploy you transform all your face up traps into elven dead eyes so all the traps that have been triggered will transform into three points each which is very very powerful just in its own right but of course it also gels very well with the elven archetype so an elven trap deck is now extremely powerful because on devotion you also transform your other artifacts so even your scenario card could technically be transformed into an elven dead eye Play Vernosiel on top of all those dead eyes, because this means that you just multiply your dead eyes incredibly high. And I mean, your opponent's board is just gone, I think. There's nothing left. Uh, and that's for a 10 provision card. So this can easily be, easily be, easily, easily, yes, easily be 12 uh, points or more on a 10 provision card. So that is good but can be even better just because how well it gels with the elven archetype which is which was already very strong in the previous meta so this i think is might actually push elves to the top of the meta because that i mean it's very hard to play against traps regardless so if you all the traps now also got a spring ability so you can spring those abilities whenever you want and they are no longer reliant on what your opponent plays but this just the addition of this alone makes elves so much more powerful because you have more swarming, you have more units on the board, you have more points on the board, and those can all be boosted, um, damaged, and stuff like that. So even the devotion ability can be cut because it would only trigger on your scenario. Uh, aside from maybe anything else that you want to add, you could ha have the location card, but in an elven deck that usually is not the case. So Eldane, very, very powerful. And the second monster card is also a very potentially powerful card. So 6 power, 10 provisions, and on deploy he spawns Blood Moon on an enemy row for one turn or up to three turns depending if uh, that love is actually flanked by two vampires. He also has an order ability that he can use every turn, but not the first turn of course because it's an order ability without zeal. You damage an enemy unit with bleeding by one. If you kill it, you spawn an Ekimara on this row. The Blood Moon in its own right does not spawn Ekimaras. Be careful about that, because the original Blood Moon does just that. Um, but this Blood Moon doesn't. But the Dead Blow effect on your Order ability is basically what his original Leader ability could do as well. But since then, Ekimaras have been boosted from 2 points to 3 points. Meaning that if you manage to kill something with his Order ability every single time, that's four points, one damage, three points of the Akimara. I, I was missing with my fingers there. Uh, four points every single turn. This is a massive engine on top of what the Unseen Elder already does. And remember, the Unseen Elder automatically applies bleeding to anything that is not bleeding yet. So this is very, very easily done to damage something that has only one power left, because all those units will be dying of attrition. That love and Unseen Elder together is game over for your opponent in most cases, unless they're going really, really high and you don't have those low-powered units. But most decks are going pretty wide at the moment. Um, 
I'm guessing that's gonna start the flip flop back in the other direction, but we'll see when the meta starts evolving. But that love, fairy, and you're getting the point already. All those leader abilities are very powerful, but this one in particular gels very well with the vampire archetype, and we'll see a lot of that on ladder. And then the final one, we finally got Horson Jr. back. And what makes this more cool than it was before is that we got his his uncensored card back. He his his butt is out, and there's naked dead ladies in the tub again. That that was the if you remember that that uh, that kerfuffle, yeah, with the CD Projekt Red kind of muted this card before because there was yeah like dead women in the bathtub. It's not exactly the same because you can't really make out that those are women. So they have redesigned it a little bit. I think before we had actual naked ladies in there uh, and now it just seems like a, a whole lot of limbs. Um, but yeah, that's enough about the art. Still incredible art piece, even though it's a very gruesome sight. But that fits the character really well. So Horson Jr. Deploy damage a boosted enemy by six and gain a coin for every point of excess damage dealt. Uh, so kind of going back to his original leader ability, just going down on the damage a little bit. On Devotion, he gains Insanity, and Insanity, of course, um, works on a Fee ability. And his Fee ability is for 3 coins, you can destroy an enemy unit with 3 power or less. You might be wondering, that is a bit weird, why not just say 3 damage for 3 coins? Because that's not actually the case, you destroy a unit with 3 power or less, meaning that you bypass everything. You bypass Defender, well, the Defender Sator just doesn't really do anything against damage, but you uh, bypass Armor and you bypass Shields. Um, of course, you can't bypass Immunity because you can't target it with the Fee ability then, but everything else is bypassed with this ability, making it very strong against um, like Shields, uh, Armored units that you can't really touch otherwise, but with very low power. Um, with a little bit of bleeding on top, you can actually take out very heavily armored units rather easily with Horson Jr. So again, very powerful card. Even without the fee ability, he gives you 11 points for um, 10 provisions, which is not that strong, but still the fee ability kind of makes up for that. It has come in handy. I've used him a few times already, and that three power can come in handy, that three power destruction ability. I've used that on multiple cards, especially against like elves, what we just talked about. You can just take out those tokens really quickly, uh, provided you have the coins for it, of course. But uh, I think this one was the last one of the new leader abilities. There's a few, well, not leader abilities, the new leader cards that have returned. Um, there's a few minor adjustments to a lot of cards, um, but you can check out the patch notes for that. Um, there's nothing that particularly interesting to talk about. Maybe there's two cards that I wanted to talk about because Syndicate has been an undervalued uh, faction for a while. I'll probably make a video on Syndicates in its entirety so really, really soon, so keep an eye out for that. But the two Poison Brothers have been buffed and they have been buffed to a broken degree and I'm guessing that will be changed in the next fix as well. And if you've seen my Taste Like Poison deck guides, then you know the deck is at the top there as well. You know how powerful this deck is, and it's even more powerful right now because of some of the changes. But Roland Blyheim originally had an Adrenaline uh, cap, where uh, at a certain point you would only trigger his abilities on poisons that were applying to your units. That is gold. So this card is now 7 power for 7 provisions, and every time a unit gets poisoned, not even during your turn, your opponent's turn, doesn't really matter, your units, your opponent's units, doesn't matter at all, every time a unit is poisoned, gain 2 coins. With this boy on your side, you don't have a coin problem anymore. That He just gives you coins. And then his brother also got a boost. Because, as you can see, he inherited the adrenaline ability from his brother, so Gallard got it from Roland, but it breaks this card. <laughs> so originally, this card had a cooldown, just a cooldown of one um, without the adrenaline requirement. Now that cooldown is marked as adrenaline five, meaning that if you have six cards or more in your hand, you can use Gallard as much as you want. This works on veiled units. So if you have enough coins, and you failed one of your abominations, you know those guys that gets boosted by two if they get poisoned, and one of those abominations is veiled, you can use all your coins, keep that in mind, all your coins, you might have nine, on 
that abomination. That's 9 times 4 because of this guy not having a cooldown. That is 36 points on that abomination. I mean, it's a huge target at that point, but that doesn't really matter. The point is, this card is broken without a cooldown. I said that during the card reviews. <laughs> Luckily, there is a cooldown on this card, because you'll see in a minute why, but it's very important that there's a cooldown on this card, because otherwise you could keep going. And it is broken. I've seen people making infinite loops with this right now, because, for example, you can poison a, four po uh, a unit, gain coins from his brother, because, of course, his brother now gets coins whenever. So every time you poison a unit, you technically gain a coin. If you find a way to keep poisoning units without stopping that, I haven't tried this with a Veiled Abomination, because I'm... I feel like it might actually work. You just gain coins infinitely and can poison and boost units infinitely. That is... it, it is insane. Because, um, yeah, it's an infinite loop. These two boys are an infinite loop, so if they don't fix this, they, they, will, they will fix this. That cooldown, it's something that I mentioned in the card reviews, that cooldown needs to be there, because otherwise this card is broken. And... it is. It just turned out to be broken. Um, yeah, those are the Blind Hand Brothers. Uh, there's a few other, other changes, uh, a whole lot of other changes. Um, the one and only thing that I want to talk about before we leave the deck builder is the change to Lockdown. Um, they've broken down the power level of Cloggers as well. So Colgrim uh, his adrenaline went down, the Mentor his adrenaline went down, but everybody knows that already. They were looking for that and everybody knows that already, but Lockdown also changed. And I need to tell you right now, don't use Lockdown at the moment. Wait for the fix, because if you're using Lockdown, you risk being banned right now. Because Lockdown, if you use the leader ability, breaks the game, literally. If you use the, <laughs> the Lockdown ability, um, I know it's coming from me, that sounds a bit weird because of my predilection against Nilfgaard, but using the Lockdown ability now physically breaks the game. You auto win the game if you use Lockdown. It's a bug, it will be fixed. If you abuse it now, you will get banned. Let me warn you about that. But they also changed what Lockdown actually does. It is still a leader ability blocking card. So on order, you disable your opponent's leader ability. But it is an order ability right now. And it only lasts until the duration of that round. If your opponent's leader has no charges left or is on cooldown, you get 6 points uh, spread out on two operatives instead. That's not what you're here for. You're of course here to lock down your opponent's ability. The provisions really haven't, they've been buffed from 10 to 13, but I think that's still too low for what the ability now does. Um, because this kind of forces your uh, opponent to either use their ability in the first round, or risk losing it in the last round. Or you can use the lockdown in the first round, blocking your opponent for, from any big plays uh, until the last round. But the ability sounds a bit neutered now, uh, because of course there's always a way for your opponent to play around this. They either use their ability in the first round, or uh, if you've used it in the first round, they still have another round that they can use it in. And usually, for most leader abilities, that's not a problem, because most of the very... Um, popular leader abilities are burst leader abilities, something you use once and gives you a lot of points. So if that's the case, lockdown will not be that strong anymore. On the other hand, for the passive abilities, that's another thing, because you basically block off those extra points during that round. On the other hand, you still have another round where you get benefits, so you'll have half the benefit of your leader ability instead of the full Monty. It's a very cool change. It makes it a little more interesting to play around. You can play around it, that's something. And your deck isn't completely broken if you face lockdown. It's a good change to my mind. But I think the provision uh, bonus needs to go up a little bit. I think if it goes to 15, it kind of is in line with the other abilities. Um, and it depends on your matchup. It just depends on your matchup. And now looking at Nilfgaard, I just realized that I missed one of the leader cards. And I missed it because I stopped at 10 provisions. And of course, there's one new card that is 9 provisions. And has a very, very cool ability. That actually works very well with Lockdown now, if you think about it. So Anna Henrietta is back. She has 3 power, 9 provisions. And what she does is she replaces your leader ability with a base copy of your opponent's leader ability. Meaning that you could use Lockdown in round 1. 
locking your opponent's ability for that first round. And then use Anna Henrietta after you've done that and refill because this resets your leader ability with your opponent's leader ability. So for example, if you're facing Patricidal Fury, you want to block your opponent from actually using Patricidal Fury in the first round. You use Lockdown and then you use Anna Henrietta to give yourself the same Patricidal Fury ability. Which is very, very strong, because then you're on the same uh, foot as your opponent in the last round, leader ability-wise, while your opponent was forced to keep it until that last round, which they usually will do in that case. But still, it's something that gels very well with that new lockdown ability, and it's not something to be underestimated. And that's it in regards to uh, the new cards and the... Well, the biggest changes that they've made to the game. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of bronze changes as well, uh, but you can check out uh, the patch notes for those because there's way too many to uh, just put this into a video in a video that is already about half an hour long. So uh, I will not be uh, bothering you with those changes. What this does do, however, is that it just has increased the amount of archetypes that seem to be viable at the moment. Spying got a boost with Amir, uh, Dwarves got a boost with uh, Bruver Hawk. The traps are back in full force with Eldane. There's a lot of support for Crown Splitters and Crimes. There's support for Vampires now. There's support for um, just Pirates and Ships in general. It is incredible what they've done with only 12 new cards and some minor tweaks to some of the existing cards and it's just really really cool to see how they can transform this game entirely with only that i don't want to downplay it because of course it's really really cool what they've done but still the what actually has changed is very minimal um because the cards are things that we knew existed already aside from a few that are new but the cards art uh, the card art was existing the abilities most of them are actually copies from what the leader abilities were so that kind of fits as well still needs to be balanced but that is what they did exactly and now they've added some minor support and changed some of the existing cards to better fit their archetype and with just that they've reinvigorated what this game can be and just expanded the possibilities of the decks that you might face because all those things i just uh talked about are new possible deck types some of which i'll be exploring over the coming weeks so keep an eye out for those deck guides we'll definitely be doing another one this week and uh, i'll keep you posted and also let me know what you think about my new intro because this is the first video that i'm using my new intro on um any feedback that i can get on that might help me improving that further down the line and adding some of those titles in between some of those animated titles so thank you guys and as normally for watching what do you think about patch 8.3 is it what you expected it to be or is it more or less just let me know it is um well, definitely, you heard my opinion. It's a great patch from, to my mind, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well. So thank you enormously for watching and hope to see you in the next video, um, well, of Grand Edge, the show for Grant. Thank you and goodbye. Stay nutty.